Well, welcome. You picked the right church today. Good job. Hallelujah. My name is Carl Thomas. They let me preach around here. I'm pretty excited about that because I like to preach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome. Welcome. Been out of town all week. It's good to be here today with the beautiful saints of Revival Life Church. Are you calling each other saints yet? Since we talked last week, yeah? Saint Sarah, right? Saint, Saint Pastor. Wait a minute. I don't, I don't think that's it. Saint Kellyanne. Good to see you this morning. <clears throat> Good to see you this morning. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I, remember, um, I remember early in my walk, and I mean really early, like maybe a couple months, maybe six, eight months in, uh, I was, as you know my story, I had uh, uh, been in the military, uh, and then I went to college afterwards, which was a really big deal because I only had a GED, and uh, just getting to college, something I never thought would happen, and I had kind of big plans post-college. Um, uh, uh, for my life, and then I met Jesus, right? Then I met Jesus, right? That's, 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 the, that's the beginning of every great story. Um, then I met Jesus, and <clears throat> as I continued in college, uh, things were happening in my heart that didn't really line up with where I had planned to go. Does that make sense? Uh, but I didn't have any other plans. I just had the plans that I'd had all along. So I started kind of crafting and tailoring my plans to kind of fit and match what was happening in my heart, but I didn't really have a piece about that. And uh, actually, I had lived such a wicked life uh, before Christ, and it was um, just so debased, I'll just say, uh, that um, the things that I felt happening in my heart, uh, I felt disqualified for. I thought that God couldn't really use me because of my past. And as a matter of fact, I had planned my um, natural career based on the understanding that because my past was so bad, there's already things that I'm disqualified from, but I figured there was something that I could attain with my gifts and abilities and, and skills, so I set a pretty high bar for myself in what I think I could accomplish based on who I was, but now God was birthing things in my heart, and I really, really had like this, 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 this chasm between what my heart was saying and what I, my mind was saying, and I really desperately needed to hear God. And I was praying a lot. I was really crying out to God, saying, God, you know, I, I, need, I, need, a, I need you to speak to me. What am I supposed to be doing in this next season? And then I found out at my church we had a prophet coming. And I didn't know what a prophet was. I'd never met a prophet. Uh, there was a guy in our church. It was kind of a big church. There was a guy who every now and then had a prophetic word for the house, but it was kind of mystical and not very detailed, so I didn't really know what it was. Uh, but I knew this guy was coming, and I was desperate to hear from God. And I thought maybe, maybe, just possibly, I could hear what I needed to hear. And uh, there's times in our walks that we desperately need, need to hear from God. And uh, as we're going through the book of Acts, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 7. And uh, like, I, like, like we've been talking about, there's been several trials that we've gone through. And I don't mean trials like my Netflix account isn't working, right? We mean like trials before the Sanhedrin, you remember? Uh, and what we find ourselves in today is the third trial so far of the book of Acts. Remember, remember the first one, I believe, is in um, Acts 3 or 4, probably 4. And what we see is um, Peter and John were in front of the Sanhedrin. You guys remember this, right? We've preached through this. You probably had it memorized because it was my message. You've probably been listening to it over and over again. It was so edifying. Um, and uh, uh, we see Peter and John, if you remember, they were before the Sanhedrin. And uh, at the end, um, they didn't know how to argue with them, so they just warned them. Remember that? They warned them to stop speaking in the name, uh, and then they just kept speaking in the name. Remember that? And then, uh, I believe in Acts chapter 5, there was another trial. This time, it says that Peter and the apostles uh, were put on trial. Uh, and then you remember that, uh, you know, they, the angel let them out of jail, so that made it difficult to have a trial. Uh, and so then they went and found them preaching in Solomon's portico, and uh, they, they willfully just went back to the trial. And this time, the first time they were warned, the second time, if you remember, they were beaten and then released after a warning, don't preach in the name, to which they celebrated and went on preaching, right? Uh, they were preaching so much, they had to uh, anoint some other people to do some, uh, some, some ministry work, and they appointed the, uh, the, 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 the deacons. Thank you very much for nobody for helping me. Uh, they appointed the, the deacons, 
and uh, the deacons were out there uh, serving, but they weren't only serving food to the widows, they were serving the word of God to whoever would listen. Right, and uh, and then then we that's what Stephen we catch Stephen doing in Acts chapter six, and that's uh, unfortunately what the uh, the the tribunal also found him doing, and so they put him on trial. So the first time we got a warning, the second time uh, we got a beating, and the third time now we find him on trial again. That's where we pick up our story of Stephen, who was a servant prophet, and ultimately we'll see in the coming weeks a martyr. Uh, we see Acts chapter seven verse one, the high priest said to Stephen, hey, they say that you've been preaching blasphemy against Moses, blasphemy against the wall, blasphemy, excuse me, the temple, uh, blasphemy against God. Are these things so? Uh, and uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 2, Stephen replies, hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. What's he doing here? What's Stephen doing here? See, when you read through the Bible, sometimes we read through it so much and we become so familiar, we stop seeing it, right? And so for years, I've read through the book of Acts over and over and over again. I remember one time we had a move of God happening in our, in our church and I just, discerned, just decided in my heart I was going to read that book of Acts 20 times through to try to just be in line with what God is doing. And I would get to Acts chapter 7, and basically, Stephen gives a, a survey of the Old Testament, if you will. He kind of just gives a survey, and, and uh, if you go to Bible college, you'll take that class, survey of the Old Testament, and they give all the high points of what happened in the history of the Jews. And so you can think that he was just doing that, but that's not what Stephen, in fact, was doing. What Stephen was doing, he was trying to tell the story of what happened to the Jews and how we got to this point. We see in verse 9, he starts talking about Joseph. And he says, you know, God raised up Joseph to be a deliverer. God raised him up, but, but, but they got jealous of him. And so they sold him into slavery. And then he was in prison. And he had all these issues. And yet and still, Joseph, through it all, after all the rejection, led them out of bondage. And then as we look at it, he talks about Moses and how Moses was raised up as a deliverer. And, uh, and, and in, in verse 25, he says, in verse, uh, Acts 7, 25 says, and he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. Does that sound like anybody else in the Bible that we might study? Right? That's the story of Christ, right? That's, that's, that's Jesus. Stephen is telling them, listen, we, we, we've gotten this wrong a couple times. We, we have gotten this wrong a couple times. And then in verse 35, they said they disowned him. He says, yet he still led them out of bondage. Even after leading them out, though, they made an idol. And they were worshiping things that man made instead of what God made. What's he doing? What's, what's Stephen doing here? He's speaking in a code. He's speaking in a code to a people who should be able to decipher this code and see what God is doing. He's speaking in a code that should be resonating with the Jewish people that, hey, God is, has done these things in the past with us, and he's doing it in the present, just like he promised. And what I want to talk to you today about is the modern prophetic voice. And I want to show you what we can learn from Stephen and, and what we see in this trial for our lives. And if anybody here goes to missionary school, if you decide to be a, a missionary and you go to a, a school for missions, the first thing they're going to teach you is learn the language. It's very difficult to minister to people you cannot communicate with. Amen? If you've ever tried to go on a trip and you just used your butchered Spanish or you're, you don't know how to pronounce anything in Portuguese, but you're going for it anyways, or you go to the Chinese restaurant and you're just, they make, I don't know if you noticed this, but all the dishes in Chinese restaurants are easy for Americans to pronounce. <coughs> Have you noticed that? I doubt that's what the Chinese food really sounds like in China. <laughs> Do you think Kung Pao chicken is a big dish in China? Probably not but it's easy for us to speak and it makes us feel like we're somewhere foreign, right? Are you with me? I don't think So was really a general, but I love his chicken, right? I just have really... It's a guess. It's a guess. I don't... You have to speak the language and know the culture. We have an amazing band 
But if we took them to, to Portugal or to Russia, it wouldn't translate because it doesn't speak to their culture or their language. Does that make sense? And um, there, there's, there's um, what we've done in the church, unfortunately, is we are currently speaking to the world as if it is a post-Christian culture, a post-Christian culture. And what that means is we had this Christianity that was kind of a, the given. It was the popular culture, and we were the home team. Christians were the home team, and the crowd is rooting for us to win. But some people have fallen away, and many people have fallen away, and they're not following what they know to be true. They're post-Christian. Many of you may have friends right now who are post-Christian. Once they walked with God, and now they're not. And many people are approaching America like it's a post-Christian nation, and I would contend that it's not. America is actually a pre-Christian nation. We have, we have like two, three, four generations who were never brought up in the ways of the Lord. They don't need to get back to Jesus. They've never been with Jesus. Their parents weren't with Jesus. Their grandparents weren't with Jesus. And we're talking to a pre-Christian culture with post-Christian language. And so, amen. And so, we're here as missionaries, and we don't even know the culture or the language of the generations that are coming up who never knew God. Does this make sense? If you're going to be a missionary, you better know the language and you better know the culture. But we're raised up in a church these days that say, if you know the language and you know the culture, you're worldly and you're not Christian. Is it possible that's why we're in a post-Christian nation? now pre-Christian nation. Is it possible? And so as I was preparing this message, the Lord told me several weeks ago I was going to bring this message today on prophecy, and I've taught on prophecy so many times, I thought that I could just, this would be an easy one for me, and so I thought that what he's always done is what he was going to do, and you got to know when you think it's going to, God tells you to do something, and you think it's going to be easy, he's setting you up, right? Like he's, he's setting you up to need him. And so as I was writing this message, the Lord told me to tell you this. If you put up my next slide, please. The Lord told me to tell you, I created you to hear from me. I crafted within your very nature the ability to hear me, and I long to talk to you. Let me say it again. I created you to hear from me. I crafted within your very nature the ability to hear me, and I long to talk to you. At the end of this service, I'm going to pray for a prophetic anointing to come upon people. And I want you to hear what I'm defining that prophetic anointing as before you sign up. Amen? You might think, that's an easy one. I'd like to be that. Wait, there's more, right? I need you to hear what we're talking about today. <clears throat> Three things I want to share with you very quickly before I go there is, there's going to be a prophetic atmosphere in the room today. As we talk about it, it's going to happen. And, uh, and in this prophetic atmosphere, you may get prophetically activated. That does not mean jump up and start prophesying. All right? Are we on the same page there? That is not what's happening. Uh, the Lord has given me a word. Uh, and um, after we're done with the service, everybody leaves. You can jump up and shout it all you want. All right? Then email it to us and we'll listen. Is that okay? Is that all right? Uh, the second thing is... Um, this prophetic teaching is going to ignite a prophetic potential in your life. Uh, the, the hope is that we're just going to shift things a little bit. And you're going to be able to see them through a prophetic lens and maybe speak with a prophetic voice uh, to your culture and your generation. And the third thing is this prophetic potential, um, it may enable you to see, hear, smell, and experience God in a new way. And that's our hope, that you could see God, that you can experience God through the way he has designed you to experience him. It's not one size fits all. It's not, I can break down the Greek word of this and then you'll know him. And it's also not, I'll lay hands on you and you'll know him. And it's also not, you have to smell roses to be healed. Right? God's created you. God knows who you are. You don't need to be me to hear from him. You don't need to be, have my past, good or bad, to serve him. God knows where you're at. Amen? I tell this story a lot, but I feel led to tell it again. Uh, I had an apostle in my life tell me um, that people who are converted later in life and go into ministry aren't as likely to finish well. And I believe he said it. I don't know why he said it, to be honest. It wasn't very encouraging. But <clears throat> I, I think um, 
you know, uh, I think he was trying to tell me, you know, stay sharp. I want you to finish well. But what I told him was God knows who he called. God could have called somebody who started well. He called me. And I am going to hold on to what God has given me. And I'm running, I'm pushing the ball forward. Amen? And uh, amen. Amen. And I met with our emerging leadership team uh, last week, I believe it was. Was it last week? Our emerging leaders meeting. Who was in there? Who's that? Who's that? Was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, make noise. Come on, make noise. Did you like it? And I told them I have some big dreams. God has given me big dreams, uh, and he's given me um, things that he wants me to accomplish, and you're the ones who are going to manifest it. <clears throat> and so I believe that, um, you know, just under the sound of what we're talking about today, God can do something through your life. Amen? Are you with me? <clears throat> the problem with the church today is the church can become a prophetic echo chamber where everybody is saying the same thing. You hear the same thing from everybody. And some people believe that that's confirmation, but the religious spirits always speak out of the crowd. Religious spirits always operate in the crowd. Religious spirits always want to quiet the voice that doesn't agree with them. God is creating a a people who know his voice, know how to share his voice, hear me, and will speak truth even when it does not benefit them. Amen. Sometimes I hear people prophesy, and I wonder, did you hear God or did you hear that other prophet? Mm-hmm. Does this make sense? Like, it's truth, but, <clears throat> <clears throat> but, the, but the juice isn't on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, did you hear God? Is everybody, God really saying the same thing to everybody right now? Yeah. Is he not contextualizing anything? Is he not actually speaking to the many cultures that are here now? My daughter is 15. Her generation needs a very different word than my generation needs. It's a very, very different word. And, uh, <clears throat> and we have to learn to speak to that culture that doesn't know how to hear him. We have to learn how to speak to a culture that does not have scriptural background for God. And and I'll get to that in a moment. If I would just give a foundation for prophetic ministry, uh, we find it in three three places in in the scripture where we see the gifts. Now, I preach on this a lot, but I want you to get it new again, all right? Put up my first uh, slide here, if you would. The first one are the gifts of the Spirit. We find these in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We talk about this a lot. We see the word of wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, say it together prophecy, distinguishing of spirits or discerning of spirits, various tongues and interpretation of tongues, right? Nine gifts, prophecy being one of them. Then we see in Romans chapter 12, we see what's called the gifts of the Father. Next slide. We see, say it together, prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving mercy, and leadership. We talked about those in our leadership meeting last week. So now we see prophecy in two. So maybe we're on to something here. Maybe something in this list is important. Let's take a look at the third one. We find in Ephesians chapter 4, the gifts of Christ to the church, the apostles, say it together, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And if you're visiting us from another church, well, we believe these five, their role is to equip other people to minister. So just because you can prophesy real good doesn't make you a prophet. Are you making prophets? Right? Your goal is to equip are you making prophets? <clears throat> I don't care how many people you win to the Lord. Are you making evangelists? And, and I need you to see this. What that tells us is the gift of God can't stop with me. Amen. It has to be passed to another generation. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't really have the gift. Whatever he's given you, it's got to get to another generation. It's not just, can I teach the Bible real good? Do I teach the word in a way that other people fall in love with the word and want to teach the word? If so, then you're probably a teacher. Not just can you, can you shepherd a flock, but can you shepherd in a way that other people care for other people? Now you might be a pastor. This makes sense. And so we believe that God is equipping people to speak his word in this day and age, we, we see all the Godhead, hear this, wants to speak to you and through you. Let me say this one more time. Put up my next slide. I created you to hear from me. I crafted within your very nature the ability to hear me, and I long 
to talk to you. And as we look at the gifts, as we look at the gifts, we see if you're like me, I want to hear him. I want to hear him in every area of my life. I want to hear him in my family life, my prayer life, my ministry life, my parenting, my finances. I desperately want to hear him in my finances and in my finances he could speak into. And I, I want to hear him in every area of my life. But, but what God is saying is not only do I want you to want it for your life, but I want you to want it so you can carry it to someone else. If we're in a pre-Christian culture, then they're going to hear the word of God from someone. Or someone will invent a God for them to worship, like we just read in, in Acts 7. Someone will create an idol for them. Someone will give them an object of worship. Why not us? Why not through us? We talked last week about Ephesians chapter 4, 29. It said, let no corrupting talk Come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may what? Give grace. <clears throat> we want to be talking in a way that we actually give grace to other people. He's given us the power to give grace to people. So the goal of our prophetic ministry is to give grace, to empower, to encourage, to draw people closer to God. There was a generation where prophetic ministry was, you know, I am the prophet. You're the person who can't hear God. You need me so I can tell you what God is saying. And I'm going to give you some instructions, and I'm going to help you run your life. <clears throat> and, and, that's, and that was a good start, but it's not a good ending point. Are you with me? <clears throat> I like the way Sean Bolt says it, if you put that up for me. Sean Bolt says, the goal of the prophetic is to connect people to God's heart. The goal is that we connect people to God. And so we need to speak in a way, hear me, we need to be able to speak in a way that we have both heard God and understand people's hearts. And that takes a little work. <clears throat> Come on, that takes a little work. That, 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 means, that means New Testament prophecy is different than Old Testament prophecy, right? Amen. You're not going to be anybody's Moses, Ezekiel, or Elijah. All right? There's a couple people on the planet who operate in a way that's outside the grid, and they speak words like that. It's probably not you, right? Can we just be honest? Can, I, can we just be honest? If it were you, people would be telling you. Can we just be honest? I mean, we all want to be that, that guy. There's a reason your picture's not on that slide, though, right? <laughs> My picture's not on the slide. I'm quoting somebody else about prophetic ministry, right? 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 <clears throat> and so prophecy, it's different than astrology, right? It's different than horoscopes, different than psychics. It's not a carnival guessing game, right? It's not like, I don't know what my future is. Tell me my future. How can someone tell you your future? You have a part to play in your future. Prophecy tells you your potential, your potential in Christ. Let me tell you the difference with prophecy and psychics. Can I just tell you this for a second for those who might be new? So a prophet hears from God or a prophetic person hears from God, and they release to you the potential, what God is trying to do in your life and through your life and the things he set up for you to do to encourage you to walk into them. Now, what psychics do is they give you warnings. Now, originally, they give you flattery because flattery is a form of manipulation. Right? And so when someone flatters you, you want to hear from them more. I mean, I like being flattered. Don't you like being flattered? And so a psychic will flatter you about your amazing future to draw you in, and then they give you a warning. But it's not really a warning because you trust them now and they have authority in your life. What it is is a curse. And so they curse you in a way, and guess the only person who can break the curse? The one who cursed you. And so you have to pay them to break the curse that they put on you. Like, oh, I'd like to, we need a reading. We need a this thing. I can set you up an appointment next week, $275, and we could probably break this spiritual thing. Then they don't say that I just put on you, right? Jesus, of course, can break the curse. But if you believe that, you wouldn't be seeing a psychic in the first place. Are you with me? Amen. See, but this is what the world is looking for. The world is looking for insight. And they're paying people who only have demons. I feel like there's a better place, but the world doesn't know about it for some reason. 
<clears throat> in the Old Testament, the prophet received the word of the Lord, right? In the New Covenant, they perceive the word of the Lord. So here's what this means. We have to both hear God's voice, but not only do we need to know God, we need to know people. A lot of people, like, <clears throat> not healthy prophetic people, but the mean prophetic people. Anybody met the mean prophetic people? The mean prophetic people are so close to God that they're angry with the people. But God loves people, last I checked. So there's a certain delusion at work there. <clears throat> but not only do we need to know God, we need to know people. So <clears throat> I play, well, I used to play more bass and acoustic guitar, right? I need you to follow me with this story for a second. So when I would play bass, I had to plug in my bass into an amp, and I would practice. Now, the lowest string on a normal bass is an E string, all right? Remember that. It comes into play in the story later, all right? And so as I would practice my bass in my office, I would practice, and when I would hit the E, it's low, it vibrates in the room, right? And everything that's tuned to E will also vibrate because the bass signal is so strong so low, you feel it. You know, you feel what's coming out of the subwoofer, right? Are you following me? Well, hanging on my wall is an acoustic guitar, and on the acoustic guitar, the lowest string is also, guess, 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 the E. And so as my bass is beginning to vibrate in an E note, the lowest string on my guitar would vibrate on its own, and I would hear out of my acoustic guitar the E note. It would literally hum the note because the sound is shaking it, right? Do you understand this so far? Yeah. The term for that is called resonance. Resonance. It resonated, right? The E was happening, and so it resonated with the other E. And so together it made this noise. This, this, let me give you another example of resonance. Have you ever been to the beach, and you're sitting there, and the waves are just hitting the shore? And it's just so calming. It's so calming that you can watch 10-hour videos of it on YouTube. You can literally let it put you to sleep. Like, you, are you feeling it already? Yeah. Well, why is that so calming? Why is that? Because that, that, that every five seconds, this, this, the, the rhythm of that is the same rhythm your body falls into when it sleeps. So when you're at the beach and you hear this waves hitting, your body is resonating with that rhythm. And you're like, oh, I know that rhythm. That's a peaceful rhythm. I'm now resonating. Is this making sense? Are you following me at all here? <clears throat> when you hear a song and you don't know the artist and you're like, oh, I, I love this. Like, I don't know who this is, but this is like it, it resonates with your spirit, right? Your spirit immediately connects to this song because this song is tapped in the same spirit flow that you're tapped into. And so it begins on a, on a soulish spiritual level, begins to resonate with you, right? Like you just hear it and you're like, yes, I need to turn this up. I'm bobbing my head. This person understands me. This is my music. It's resonating. Are, 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 are you getting that? This is what prophecy is supposed to be. Prophecy is speaking a word in alignment with what the Spirit is already speaking in the people's lives. So you've heard God clearly enough that you can speak a word that resonates with their spirit man. But they didn't know it was God. They didn't understand that God was the one speaking this thing, or maybe they knew, but they weren't sure, and the word comes, and all of a sudden, bam, I am now resonating with God. This is what prophecy is supposed to look like. And, and when we do this, when we speak a word from God that resonates, when we will lay down our expectations and our definitions and our, our, our religious packaging that we put around prophecy, when we'll put down our need to understand the words that we're delivering, when we put down our need to look like we know what we're doing, that we, we sing a note that strikes the chord in someone's heart. This is what we do. And our job is not to argue someone to faith. Our job is to speak a word of resonance. As we do this, the spirit that's already at work 
in them brings that word to life. That's what happens. I'm preaching on giving, and then you just hear a word, I need to love my neighbor. Because something in that message, Holy Spirit speaks, and it resonates within you, and you know what God is speaking into your life. Does that make sense? This is our role as Christians. It's not just to learn how to say things. It's to resonate. It's to resonate. If we look out the window and there's a storm happening, and we see the trees moving, right? We see the trees moving. And we deduce that the wind is blowing, right? But the trees are not moving the wind. It's the wind that moves the trees. And for too long, the church has been trying to force the culture to resonate with the word that spoke to them 30 years ago, but God isn't actually speaking to the culture today. In effect, we're shaking trees, wondering why the wind is not coming. What we need to do is figure out what the wind is doing. We need to figure out what the wind is doing and react to that. You know, they say that every revival's greatest persecutor is the last revival. Because they say, no, 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 that's not how the wind blows. It's like, no, 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 but that's how the wind is blowing now. That's how the wind is blowing now. Don't you see the trees? False fire. No, it's really not. Nothing wrong with what you did. But we got to speak a word in due season. We have to speak to our current culture. And so we see Stephen in this passage. We see him trying, hear me, desperately. He's desperately trying to engage his culture using their words, using their history, using their experience, using their good and their bad. He's desperately trying to engage his current culture to connect them with God and what God is trying to do. And he's trying to connect them with a God who's desperately trying to connect with them. He's using all of his powers and all of his tools of reason and history and everything he knew because they all knew the history. They all knew the history, and and he's trying to reframe it in a way. Hey, listen, can you see what God is doing? Doesn't it resonate within you? I need you to see what's happening in in the church in America, and and I'm going to step out on a ledge here a little bit. In all our political power that we've come into agreement with, is it's not filling the pews. All our political power is not filling the pews. Amen. And I'm not speaking against or for political powers, but we're called to fill the pews. We have a generation. And if, I, if you're in this room, I'm not even talking about your generation. I'm talking about people younger than you. We have generations whose very idols are committing suicide regularly. They're looking for peace. They're looking for community. We have generations that have never been as connected as they are today, yet they're committing suicide because they're lonely. And we have generations that that are dying for acceptance. What's the story of the LGBTQ community? We accept you. Come in as you are. We accept you. They're telling the story of acceptance better than we are. <laughs> Hear me. Hear me. No, no. Come on. For one class, we all clap. Who has the story of peace better than we do? Who has the story of community better than we do? Who has the story of come as you are? Who has the story of, like, we will take you, and we don't care what you've been through? Who has that story better than the church? <laughs> But we keep giving them the story of legalism and rules and, and, and it'd be better if you never got married than to get divorced. We have to do better. I mean, the church has to be a place that people find community, find love, find acceptance. Isn't that what you found in Christ? That's the story we need to be telling the world. Let me tell you, put it up. The church needs to become missional again. We got to look at our world and say, that's my mission field. Do I know the language? Do I know the culture? Do you know young people 
Don't listen to bands anymore. There's a guy pushing buttons. And we're speaking to them with guitar solos. And I'm not trying to talk about the band. I like our band. I like live music. I'm just using it as a metaphor. We, we, we think that we're out there to, to whip the world back into shape. But Jesus said in Matthew 10, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. That doesn't sound like he sent us to whip the world into shape. He said, hey, I'm going to send you out there and you're going to be desirable to people who want to do harm to you. Use that. But what we have to do as a church is we have to empty ourselves of our agenda. We like a safe little church. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus was always around roughnecks. Jesus was always around thieves. Do you think thieves stopped stealing when they got around Jesus? I got a guy named Judas you should read about. But in this church, like, if we just went by Jesus' ministry, one out of 12 of us should be complete heathens. If we went through his final ministry, one out of three was a heathen. Half of his final ministry didn't accept him on the cross. Right? And so as a church... We gotta, we gotta, we gotta figure this thing out a little bit better. I, I tell the story about, and many of you know this. I, um, uh, <clears throat> I was part of a, a, a church plant team, and and uh, things weren't really going well for me. And uh, and I was, I'm just, tell, I haven't told you guys the whole story. Um, uh, I, I've told you about the word that God gave me. I didn't tell you the whole context. So I was sitting on the toilet one Sunday morning <laughs> when the Lord spoke. It was close to the shower. That's probably why it was anointed. But I'm just sitting there, sitting on my sitter, right? And, and the Lord speaks to me. The Lord tells me, give up your, your, your leadership position and go start a church in your house. That's what the Lord told me, as clearly as you hear me. Give up your leadership position and go start a church in your house. And, and my wife and I said, hallelujah to half of that, right? I said, hallelujah to the whole thing. My wife said, hallelujah to half of it. <clears throat> And so I did, and I went to a guy who I considered an elder, and, uh, and I said, hey, this is, this is uh, here's what happened. Um, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, give up your leadership position in your church and go, go start a church. And he said, I agree with half of that. You sound like my wife. What, what's happening here? What am I coming to you for? <laughs> but I had determined that I'm not going to hear God alone. I determined that a long time ago. I, I just, I'm not going to hear God alone. And if I don't trust, I mean, you got to trust somebody. Yeah. And like, my thing is, God, I went to this guy, I'm trusting you. And so I didn't. And then, um, and then a little bit later, my wife and I decided what we could do is we could sell our house. We could move somewhere broke. You know, I could go to college. They were buy a house. We were going to move to Oklahoma City or whatever, wherever, where, Tulsa, excuse me, Tulsa. And I was going to go to grad school and hook up with a ministry. And that's just how I would go to, I had a, I had a new plan figured out. And, um. And uh, I went to another elder, and I said, okay, I'm going to, here's, here's the thought, here's the plan for my life. Uh, we are going to move, and I'm going to go to grad school, and uh, this is what we're going to do. He said, yes, you should definitely get more education. No, you should not move away. And so my plan on how I was going to get in the ministry is gone. And so here I am. I'm not in the church I helped plant. I'm not going to school. But I had determined that I am going to hear God in community. And as that time went on, the proper time came for me to start that ministry again. That ministry now is this. Because I waited on God's timing, allowed him to do what he wanted me to do, my family is better off. Whoever leases this space to us is better off. I mean, like, you're better off. Like, because I decided I wasn't going to rush out. Like, other people were able to benefit from God doing in my life. And I certainly haven't been perfect, but we, we have to give up our addiction to assurance. We have to give up our addiction to assurance. 
and, and, and um, we have to actually have faith and patience. And I just have a couple of quick things I want to kind of run off to you here. Maturing in the prophetic requires... <laughs> maturing in the prophetic requires a maturity to understand that not everything that we see, that we're not going to do everything we see when we see it. Let me say that again. Maturity in the prophetic is going to require us to be mature enough to say that we're not going to do everything we see when we see it. Now, here's the kicker. If we're going to be people who can see into the future, we're going to have to believe that there is a future. And not everything in the future is going to happen right now. We're going to have to be mature enough to say, okay, that I saw into the future. Because mo most words come as potential, right? They don't come as now, as a gift, as a, it's potential. And God is still allowing us to be in the story. And so mature people go from hearing God alone to hearing God with other people in a way that it resonates with them. We're not scared to have somebody tell us, that doesn't really resonate with me. I'm not getting that at all. This part, probably. That part, definitely not. So... <clears throat> So I was this young guy in the Lord, and this prophet's coming to town, and I'm like, oh, God, do I need a word? About to graduate college. I think I had, yeah, I was about to graduate college, and I had nothing. I had no plan B. I had no idea what I was doing with my life. The thing I felt called to do, I was unqualified for. The plan that I had was no longer going to work. And I was just desperate, and the prophet showed up, and I'd never met him before, and he had a a row open in the front, and he said, uh, uh, he had called a list of names of people that he had prophetic words for, and I wasn't on the list, you know, he didn't know me, and he's prophesying all kind of good stuff over them, and I'm like, I need to hear the Lord, and so every now and then he would call someone out, and the meeting went pretty long because it was a prophet, right, and, um, <clears throat> and as people would leave, like I was in the back, and as people would leave, I'd move up into their seat. I'm slowly making my way to the front, like, and near the end of the service, there's like people standing, kind of like in the front, like, if you got any more words, I wouldn't mind taking one home. I was desperate, though. I was like, Lord, you have to talk to me in this season. You have to talk to me. And he called me out, and he began speaking to me. He speaks to me a prophetic word that still has resonance in my life right now and he starts talking about my ministry and he starts talking about my future and he starts talking about the harvest and if I were to be honest with you he started talking to me about you and he talked about a people that would come to life and I'm just believing today in the name of Jesus I'm believing that God will raise up a generation of people who will speak to their generation what God is speaking. Is your, is your culture post-Christian? I hope you got a post-Christian word for them. Is your, is your generation pre-Christian? I hope you get a pre-Christian word for them. I hope you get a word of resonance in life because that's what God is doing on the earth. Stand with me, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would anoint, ha, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I feel it right now, here it is, in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray that you would put that word that burns, that burns on the inside, you would get the fire, the coal from the altar, and you would touch lips with the word of the Lord for this generation, Jesus, a word of love a word of acceptance, a word of healing, a word of community, a word of peace, Father, that we would go out in the highways, in byways, and we would cry out to you for a word for a people who desperately need a living God, Father, for a people who desperately need to hear the story that they are within, the little story of their life and how it fits into the big story of Jesus Christ coming to the earth and dying on a cross, Father. I pray right now in the name of Jesus. I pray in the name of Father. I cry out right now in the name of Jesus that you would anoint a people to reach a generation. 
that we would stop at nothing. Fire of God upon you right now. The fire of God upon you right now. The fire of God upon you right now. Right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare a prophetic unction in your life. In the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, can you give a clap offering to the Lord, please?